Hey guys, welcome to the live show for Assassin's Apprentice, the first book in the Farseer trilogy by Robin Hobb. We will be discussing this in detail today. That is why we are all gathered here, as I'm sure you know if you are already here. <laughs> Everybody's got the... <laughs> Um, just before we get started, the live show for the next book will be at the beginning of June and it will be on Ashley's channel. I have linked her channel in the description box so you can go head over there, subscribe so that you're ready for the next one. And we're just going to start off with our general thoughts and feelings, I guess. So I gave it five stars. I really liked it. I really like the atmosphere of it because it's a coming of age fantasy, which is something that I've just realised that I actually really like. And yeah, that's my basic thoughts. Cass, do you want to go next? Uh, yes. So, hello, everyone. I'm Cass. Uh, my channel is at WhatCassRed. Um, I love this series. This is my favorite series of all time. And I believe that I gave... I have to look it up now. I wanted to give you my first review rating. Um, I believe I gave it four. Oh, no. I gave it five stars. I gave it five out of five stars. <laughs> <That was easy. laughs> Ash? Uh, yep. I So I'm Ashley, if anyone doesn't know. And I had a weird experience because I read this book years ago and rated it three stars. But then coming back to it now, could not for the life of me remember anything about that experience. So I read it as if it was new now and absolutely fell in love with it. I don't know whether it was a difference of coming at it from a different age or anything but I rated it five stars this time around and absolutely adored it so Zaz? Okay I'm in a really really tricky position with it where I still haven't given it a Goodreads rating because I'm stuck between four to five stars mm. but it's like definitely high up there and it's like I'm just gonna say it in like a simple way it's like the name of the wind but way better if that makes sense. I'm going to oh, throw that out there, but yeah, that's my... I also gave Name of the Wind five out of five stars. I did not like the Name of the Wind. <laughs> <laughs> Cody? Um, so this is my second time reading this series. I gave it five stars the first time I read it. It's one of my favourite series. Um, not my ultimate fave, but I totally get the Name of the Wind vibes too, which I also gave five stars. Um, but my favorite thing about this is that I love talking animals in books or communications mm -hmm. with animals. So I'm going to be a sucker for it no matter what. But I also think the world is really well done and the writing and the characters. I love them all so much. So, yeah, that's my little ramble. <laughs> Rage? Um, I think I had a disconnect with this book. It just didn't touch me the way it seems to have touched everybody else. Um, I had a disconnect between the style of writing and the kind of story that was being told. Um, it being in first person kind of threw me off overall. So I mean, we'll go into that later, but I think for me, it's kind of like a four and it could go a little bit higher, but it could also go a little bit lower depending on which elements of the book I think about. Mm, yeah, makes sense. So I think, um, I'll do like a brief synopsis. This is like, it follows Fit Chivalry, Farseer, not Fitzwilliam Chivalry, <laughs> as I kept calling him in my blog. Um, I got right to the end of the book before they actually said his full name. So it follows Fit Chivalry, Farseer, who is the bastard son of the prince that is heir to the throne. And his grandfather drops him off at the keep and says that he doesn't want him anymore and he has to go back to his father. However, when Fitz arrives at the keep where his father lives, he finds out that his father has abdicated and gone to live in the countryside with his wife. And then nobody really knows what to do with Fitz. So he's being taken care of by, are you ready for the tongue twister? The man that looks after Fitz's father's hounds, horses and hawks. <laughs> <laughs> um, and he becomes a father figure for Fitz and it's just following Fitz's life story up until the age, I think it's 6 to 14, as he is being trained to be an assassin for the king. So the general tone of this, the writing style, Rachel, I know, should we kick off with you? <laughs> Go straight into the negatives on the writing style. I, I liked the writing style, but I'm interested to see what you've got to say about it. So Robin Hobb chose to write the story in the first person. So it's as though Fitz is telling this story. However, it's Fitz telling his, his story of the past. So you can kind of tell that it's coming from an older perspective and he's very much in this storyteller 
mode. And often in certain scenes, it can feel as though you're very distant from what's happening to Fitz because you're not experiencing it then and there with him. You're being told that this happened to him. And so for me, then there was the, the disconnect there. And um, it was the writing style, I feel, very classical fantasy. And so you would have large sections of info dumping, which can be really helpful in the beginning of a story to like get you used to what's going on in the world building. But at the same time for other people, sometimes it can feel too much. Um, how did like everybody else feel in terms of like it being first person? Cause that was like a shock to me. It was, it'd been a while since I've read like a first person narrative. Name of the yeah. Wind, as you mentioned, does that, but only in some, well, in the major parts of the book, but because he is telling the story within that part. I liked that it was first person. I really didn't expect it. I obviously like the most recent epic high fantasy that I've read is Game of Thrones. So I was expecting the typical like really dry, really clinical writing style that you tend to get with adult high fantasy. Mm. So I was really shocked when it was first person. And I also think that Robin Hobb's writing was a lot more prosaical than I expected it to be. I found it to be very descriptive and very atmospheric, which I wasn't expecting. Um, so I really connected with that writing style and I really liked it, but I have also just read The Bear and the Nightingale, which has a very similar writing style, albeit a lot more flowery. Mm. Um, but yeah, I think the the writing style worked for me because it's kind of, it reminds me of, it reminded me a lot when I was reading it of the style in which The Princess Bride is told, the movie. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, and I love that movie. So yeah, I like that storytelling style. I think what you said thematically really kind of defines it. And I feel like Cody, Rachel, and basically anyone who's read The Name of the Wind can kind of get that essence of why it's kind of working. But like, okay, I'll be honest, like, I I felt like it was better on an emotional level, but I felt I, I had the same issue with The Name of the Wind in the sense that I feel with that writing style choice, you know there's no real stakes for the main character because you know they make it out alive. And yeah. I feel like that was kind of frustrating for me because I just didn't feel the intensity of the stakes because the fact of the matter is the way emotions are written and the way like thematically things are conveyed and like just the feeling of how things are going, you know they come out of this not that like mentally affected or emotionally affected or physically impaired it feels like so I'm just like I didn't care about it as much as I could have but it definitely had a feel of like that coming of age feel was so nice and so well done but um I feel like it was written like a movie does that make sense like um, as you said I like I could yeah. literally imagine a princess bride remake of this yeah yeah you know but I, I, would, I think it was so good yeah Karen. I would say that like this could be um, a sign of like, cause you know, Patrick Rothfuss name of the wind, his first novel, uh, Assassin's Apprentice is Robin Hobb's first novel. So this could also be just their way of breaking into this big genre by doing a first person narrative. Uh, for those who don't know, like when you go forward in the series, the live ship traders is actually going to be um, third person. So she does switch it up eventually. Uh, I personally liked the first person narrative. We just don't get that often. Um, I can name probably on one hand the the fantasy novels that I've read that are in first person. And this one, I just like, this brings me into such a level with Fitz. I feel for him like on such a deep level because of this first person narrative. I don't know, but I also feel for the other kids. Yeah, I don't want to get ahead. That's what I'm like really trying to do, like get ahead of the conversations that we're having right now. Yeah. This should be really easy. Like we can just sit back while um, Cass and Cody gush. <laughs> really easy for the rest of us. <laughs> it's interesting though, because somebody, I think somebody commented on my video saying that they felt like this was a safe fantasy, which is a very rare feeling that you can just read a fantasy and feel relaxed almost. And obviously because yeah. of the slower pace of it, it's kind of nice to just sit and take it in. And then with the added narration style, because obviously you know that whatever happens, he is going to be okay. <laughs> I have to say, I really agree though with that perspective that it is a safe fantasy because I feel like I've seen this series in so many defining high, fan high adult fantasy recommendations. You know, like when people say, here's a good introduction um, to the world of high fantasy. And I felt like it was really, like I think one of the most riveting things for me was like, a female writing mm -hmm. 
adult fantasy and it becoming such a big thing mm -hmm. is so scarce and I, I felt like you could see how well she writes characters mm -hmm. and I feel like with a lot of male kind of focused writing there seems to be this kind of subconscious inherent kind of not sexism but like misogynistic perspectives on fantasy that you kind of see in the writing of how both men and women are wrote but Robin doesn't do any of that mm -hmm. and I really really appreciated that lack of you know that extra gross undertone that you don't really enjoy yeah it's really refreshing to see and trying not to get ahead but the female characters that she writes are really really good even though they're not the main focus at the beginning of the story y'all will see and you'll be you'll be fans i am really interested in that actually because i did notice the lack of female characters it makes sense with the setting but just with it being a female author i expected more but then also just generally with the book with it being the first book in not only a high fantasy trilogy but also this like 16 book universe um i i kind of get it because a lot of the complaints that people have had in the chat and those of us reading it for the first time is that it is quite slow to get into which it definitely is because not a lot happens for the longest time which is tends to be typical with coming of age fantasy anyway um, but I feel like she's laid a lot of groundwork for a lot of good stuff to come. But yeah, I'm excited. But like, I just really don't know what to expect. Because I think with high fantasy, with so much going on, like it could literally be anything and I have absolutely no idea. Yeah. We, we mentioned a little bit ago about the pacing there. And I was wondering if anybody else, like, have you, were you thinking of bringing that up, Becca, in terms of... Like... Um, I think the pacing is definitely something we should discuss because it is something that a lot of people said in the Discord, like everybody was saying how slow it was. I didn't notice. Um, I did read it quite slowly, but that is because I pretty much, like, I read it over a week and I wasn't reading very much that week at all. But I, I don't know what it is about coming of age fantasy because I definitely recognise that it is slow, but I just get so absorbed that I don't care that nothing's happening. I felt exactly the same way about The Bear and the Nightingale and literally nothing happens in that book until right at the end either. Uh -huh. um, so it, it's really hard for me to talk about this because I don't feel it. Like I didn't feel the slowness. Like I acknowledged mm -hmm. that it was, but in my like perspective, it just wasn't. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if anybody else struggled with how slow it was. I did the first time. Mm. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Ashley. <laughs> I was just going to say, I kind of, I can see that it's slow, but with, like, with Becca, I just, like, I read 200 pages in one day, well, no problem. Um, so I think I started off slower and then I hit a point where I was just like, I don't care, I'm just going to read all of this. And I didn't really mm -hmm. notice it at all. Mm -hmm. I um, noticed it the first time. The first time I read it, I was like, oh my God, this is so slow up until the 100 page mark. And that's mm -hmm. when I actually really started to get invested in the story. But upon reread, I don't know if it's because I know what to expect or if it's because I've just read more of these types of books now that it's come to be expected. And it was just such a breeze to reread because I was a little bit nervous because I was like oh I remember this was really slow to begin with mm -hmm. this is going to take me ages and then I read it within the space of like two days because I just love it so much mm -hmm. but yeah, yeah. I, I got that the first time but I think it depends on what you're used to as well mm -hmm. in terms of pacing of books I agree with that so so much sorry real quick it's just like I like I only realized this recently but I like books that actually treat you you not like a child they don't try to hold your hand too much they like they treat you seriously like an adult when you're reading adult and like all that complex language all of that lengthy use of words and stuff like that and it, even it's sometimes even poetic even though there's no actual poeticism I, I like that seriousness and I think the book treats you like an adult because you know you're coming from an adult perspective even though it's coming of age you know and I, I don't know there was something really really mystical about it in an in a really nice endearing kind of way it's like you're like merlin has just come over like let me tell you the story of how i like you know the magic and stuff but yeah sorry carry on yes oh um gosh what was i gonna say so for the pacing i also agree that like i knew it was slow but it didn't feel that way to me because i just really enjoyed his day-to-day -day. and now that I've come to expect that out of Robin Hobb. Every single time I pick up her book, I just know that it's going to be a book that I have to take my time with. Um, literally every single time I pick up a new Robin Hobb book, I tell my husband, I'm like, do you see who the author of this book is? What does that mean? <laughs> that means that you don't interrupt me. That means I'm going to take my time. <laughs> um, yeah, I've had to say that a couple of times where I'm like, no, this book I need to be present with. Um, and 
I feel like there's so many uh, fantasy books out there where I've literally like skipped past pages because I wasn't as engaged. But because I slow down to read at the pace that she is delivering Fitz's story, I feel like I'm more present mm. with him. Just a quick question, just for everyone who's actually here and even the audience. Like, don't you think it's kind of important that sometimes there is some variation in the kind of way books are written? Because I feel like, especially like if we look at a, a YA fantasy audience primarily, a lot of the books tend to be really, really, really quick. Mm. And there isn't that much in-depth you know, mm -hmm. intake of what's going on. But when when it's fantasy, it tends to be really, really slow. And then the, the only real fast sequences tend to be like the action sequences or stuff like that, or when there's a giant plot twist. Mm -hmm. um, so what do you think on that? I feel like, I feel like it is important for things to be different. I'm not sure, I, I haven't really thought about it in terms of young adult and adult, but in the terms of how I normally plan out how I'm going to read my TBR, I kind of stagger it so that I can, like, I know what's going to be fast paced. Like a thriller is going to take me a day, a fantasy is going to take me up yeah. to a week kind of thing. Um, it definitely helps with my reading momentum because I can, like, put things so that I'm constantly reading at, like, a steady pace. Um, I think it is important that books are different paces. I think with any form of storytelling as well, it kind of just, it's, it's refreshing to have it different and different types of story require a different type of telling. Like you're not gonna get the same impact from somebody's life story if it is faster paced. Cause a lot of the complaints that I have about young adult fantasy now is that I don't feel anything for the characters because I haven't had this 200 pages of pretty much nothing at the beginning to really care about who they are. Yeah, they become less memorable as well over time. You don't remember anybody's names. I mean, that's mm -hmm. difficult enough as it is as a booktuber because you read so much. But mm -hmm. yeah, and um, yeah, I completely agree with you. Anybody else? I think for me, I just yeah. felt like there wasn't like major plot beats that I would expect from this kind of book. But maybe it's just because I wasn't as emotionally invested, and so whenever a plot beat happened, then it just wasn't didn't impact me as much. Um, which I think is going to happen. Like if you're not if you're not as engaged, then potentially it's just not going to feel as like impactful. Each time something happens, but the way that you guys have explained it, like it is this kind of winding road. It's slow. It's poetic. It's like romantic prose in a sense, and you're meant to just be there with the characters. But if you've not then connected with the characters, then you just get a little bit lost. But I have heard from people who are like in the same situation as you, where it's like they liked Fitz, but they weren't in love with Fitz. Yeah. And they liked this first book, but weren't really sold on the whole investing in Fitz's life yet. Yeah. Um, and as Royal Assassin comes around for book two, I feel like that's when people start, who might be on the same fence as you, might start really caring about him, which kind of sucks that like, you have to go through a whole first book just to finally start caring about a character. But um, yeah. if that gives you any hope. I liked him and I liked his magic system. And I think that he's like, I mentioned it before, like this cute Hufflepuff baby boy. <laughs> really, really sweet, really cute puppy dog, all good. Um, I, like, I want to protect him, but I'm not like, I would be quite happy if he just kind of disappear. That's okay. I thought you were going to say I'd be quite happy to die. That was die. Not <laughs> yet. Um, <laughs> while we're still talking about the pacing a little bit, a lot of people in the chat have said that the some of the issues that they had with the pacing was not necessarily just the writing style. It was also how emotionally taxing the book was because it is not a happy story, which I did not expect going into it. Um, I... Yeah, I just, I really didn't expect that actually. I mean, I should have thinking of like adult fantasy that I've read in the past. Um, but no, I didn't. I First off, I didn't expect it to be first person as we've already discussed. So that obviously puts you close to the character to start off with. And then man, just the shit that Fitz goes through. <laughs> I think the melancholy though, like, um, because it's such a big series, I like to think that because it follows him through, even even though it's a very long time, like four to sixteen, or sorry, six to six to four. I'm I'm an idiot, yeah. basically. <laughs> but the point is, it's just like you're following in the scope of fantasy a very very small period of time that most stories completely gloss over, and 
it's dealt with such melancholy that I feel like this entire book, and I know it's very rich to use an entire book as an establishing book, but sometimes some stories need that. And I feel like this entire book was really meant to like set the undertone for the character for everything that comes in the future. Maybe Cody and Cass can like clarify this, but that's the kind of sense I got from it. <laughs> like you can just say yes or no. Like, come on. Well, yeah, Robin anything. Hobb puts her characters through some shit. Mm-hmm. That's... Also, if you're not prepared for that level of shit to happen to a character, <laughs> she's not your author. <laughs> I um, realized that um, I, I must just read miserable stuff because I was reading it. And I did acknowledge that like emotions were to be had. I think on my vlog, I was just like, this is just one big sad. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. but I, we had this conversation in like when we did bonus on Becca when we were just like this book's miserable and I'm like oh I, God, yeah. books? I, I don't, don't think I don't think Assassin's Apprentice is quite the level of the song rising like that is <laughs> mm. that is just sad we'll, yeah. we'll get there in <laughs> but I th- yeah I do think it's gonna happen I liked having my heart broken for context yeah. when I first read this book this was like three years ago when I first read this book I had just come off the Shadowhunter series I had just decided to put Cassandra <laughs> Clare aside <laughs> and I needed something else in my life so I yeah. liked the realness and I liked mm. having my heart broken yeah. I also like seeing characters suffer I finished a book last night that was like emotionally devastated me like I spoiled it for Ashley I FaceTimed her and was like can I spoil the end of this book because like Oh my god. Um, <laughs> but I definitely I find it a lot. Which book was it? It was uh, Restless Slumber by KJ Sutton. There we go. Yeah, god, that was a lot. So I I find it a lot more impactful. There's just something about me as well. Like all of my favorite movies are like tragic ones. Like I like to see characters suffer. I don't know why. I think it makes you just, there's a part of you within yourself that automatically cares more, especially when it's happening to someone so young. Mm. I think that's the real fucked up thing. Like, as an adult, they, like there's this automatic assumption that you'll be able to handle things a bit better. Like, you have the ability to handle things better, and there are things at your disposal to be able to deal with things. But it's like, he's, he's a little boy, he's baby. <laughs> yeah. It's Actually, like the whole book oh, sorry, is kind sorry. of about, like, loneliness it tends mm-hmm. to be a big theme. Mm-hmm. And I feel like for any emo kid out there, you resonate with this book. <laughs> like, it just gets you. <laughs> um, Ash, I don't know if you want to address the comment that I just flashed up because it is something that you said in your vlog about the themes yeah, it, of depression. It was one of those things where because it wasn't named, I didn't know whether to put a trigger warning on it or not. But there was one very specific scene where I read it and was just like flawed because I have never read a scene depicting what I would call depression so closely like I I can't it was it like chapter five or something it was pretty early on mm. I read it and was like I just the general sense of really deep loneliness and just loss I guess it was almost like he was grieving for so much at once and just felt empty and I was like I've never read such an accurate depiction or something that's close to my own not to get deep or like my own uh-huh. experiences and I was like I, I've just never seen it and I did not expect it in a fantasy book of all things because you just don't tend to see mental health stuff in fantasy books no. <laughs> I feel you I felt but, exactly the same way like it felt so real and raw and unflinching I loved it I, I <laughs> think that it's definitely something you could name within yourself because if it resonates with you like it's even I feel like sometimes that's where it isn't necessarily what the author is putting down. It's sometimes how we read a book that really defines what the character is going through. Because if you read a book, you know how sometimes people age people up. It can also be sometimes someone's sadness is their depression, you know. And I feel like um, representation, even though it isn't explicit representation, can be a representation in these kind of situations. Because it's a bit more nuanced and because it's not necessarily in a realistic, like, our modern world times frame or uh, you weld or anything it's kind of more fair to put those words into it Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because they wouldn't have an awareness of depression existing to start off with in Mm -hmm. the assumed time period because it's like assumed medieval I would say it did I definitely recognized it as a depressive state like that is what it felt like to me Mm -hmm. um it was also it was when he was grieving nosy um, and I definitely can see the parallels to his state and my experience with grief. I definitely recognize some aspects of that. So um, I do think it was a depressive state. I kind of wish it was addressed in the book a little bit, just not even, 
not even anybody saying like, oh, this is depression, but him kind of acknowledging the period of time that he went through when he was like that and actually, you know, just coming to some, because he just kind of like, once he got over it, it did take him some time, he kind of just went on with his life um, and never really dwelled. Well, I suppose it's good not to dwell on it, but never really. I feel as though like he brought up nosy occasionally over the time between, like it wasn't just like he was completely gone. I felt like there were small Mm. mentions of, of that as though, yeah as though it was coming back to him when certain memories were happening. Well, he did hold a grudge oh, for a very long time. Like, a yeah. very big Against grudge. Bridge. Yeah. Wait, does yeah. anyone have the illustrated edition? Yes. yes. Okay, I'm <laughs> sorry. Can we... <laughs> this is spoilers. Bro, this broke me. What is that? Don't do that to me. Oh, no. Oh, no. Yeah. Why? Oh. Like, all of the illustrations broke me. <laughs> I won't lie, though. I have to say, whoever did the illustration, I definitely want to research the artist. Some of these pieces are mm. <laughs> very nice. Very, very nice. I kind of want the illustrated edition, but I also really like my baby editions. <laughs> I know, that that oh. one. Oh, my God. Uh, oh my God. God. Can, we, can we just talk about how his head is being patted? Is that in the <laughs> oh, story? Can we talk about He's this? Baby. That's covers, uh, he's yeah. literally baby. He's baby. Yeah. But also both are absolutely fine in the illustrated edition. Like <laughs> mm-hmm. Right, so I think it's safe to say that anything we discuss from now on will probably contain spoilers for the contents of the book. So if you have not finished it yet and you don't want any like if you're already near the end, I can't imagine us spoiling so much. But yeah. if you're if you haven't finished, then now is the time to disappear. Before we move on entirely, somebody did ask a question about the depressive thing. Um, okay. Scott from Creation says, do you guys think the, the depressive time is explained away as magic or him being under the influence? I didn't get that from it. I thought it was very interesting how his powers were. Like, I didn't understand whether, because I don't think it was explained away, but I didn't understand whether he was in that state because of grief or because of the severance of the bond. Because he does have another bond severed, I believe. And he I'm doesn't have that. Gonna, like, like the scene that. I was talking about isn't even related to the animals. Um, oh, wasn't it? I thought it was after Nosy died. Is it the gallon part? Um, I think Chade Where he can't skill anymore. When Chade kicks him out and everybody's just like angry at him and he hasn't got anybody. Oh, yeah, that it was. Oh, yeah. yeah. He needs to go back and he's lost everything and he's just. He yeah. Just um, mm-hmm. I, yeah, I'm not sure I would say it was explained away as magic. But then, yeah, there was, like, the whole nosy thing after nosy died as well. I think it's kind of a situation because, like, maybe this is me going too deeply, but it's like when you're looking back at a situation, you don't want to go too in-depth on the parts of your life that were too shitty, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Like, you want to talk about them and then leave them. Mm-hmm. But maybe that's just me overly thinking about it. It could just be Robin Hobb was too lazy to, like, remember yeah. to, like, give it more thought. I always have that feeling. I don't know whether I'm reading too much into something to justify things or whether you're <laughs> just being lazy. There was also the part as well where he fails to learn the skill mm-hmm. and yeah, almost throws himself off. Like uh, it's yeah. real. Um, and that depressive part afterwards, where he quite literally just says that he didn't do anything until Gallen came in and was like, "Right, you're gonna go work." Yeah. <laughs> um, I think yeah. that was pretty good as well because. Quite often it does take someone else being like, you are going to do this, and mm. that will mm-hmm. eventually pull you out of it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. It's when he started weeping, he just let it all out that my heart broke. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that scene. Yeah. Yeah. It's still bad. <laughs> mm. So while we are discussing the characters, I know Cody wanted to talk about chivalry and how everybody just seems to adore him. Like, yeah, he's the I best thing ever. <laughs> I think it's it's very telling of the shadow that Fitz is in and maybe why Regal is so intimidated by Fitz because he is looks so much like his father yeah. and everyone holds him in such high esteem but yet he fell but you know Burick and and Chade still put him on this pedestal and very he's almost struggling to fill his shoes everything is always yeah. well Shiva we would have done it this way you know, mm-hmm. and very he's always like, oh, I don't quite have the tact to do it that way, or mm-hmm. Chivalry would have fixed it already. 
I just think I wanted to know what all you guys are thinking of because it makes me angry, I've read actually. Past- like the mm. whole thing makes me really angry because he wasn't there. He wasn't there for his son and he knew that his son was there and everybody still holds him in such high regard. And mm-hmm. he abandoned his post, he abandoned his child. And I just, I don't quite understand it. And I'm hoping that if people do hold him in such high regard, it's going to get explained in later books because I still don't feel as though that was resolved for me. Mm-hmm. I have conflicting opinions on chivalry. Um, firstly, I do agree with Rachel. Like, I can't understand why everybody thinks a man that abandoned his son is so great. Mm-hmm. Like, if, if chivalry always does the right thing, if chivalry is so perfect, then why didn't he do the right thing? And continue, like, why didn't he continue to be king or, like, continue to be the heir to the throne? And why did he leave his son? But, and I know, I'm not sure how many of the Game of Thrones live shows that Ashley watched, but I'm pretty sure Cass watched them all and everybody else was there. And I know you're all sick <laughs> of my bullshit. But I get, like, mad Rhaegar vibes Mm. from chivalry. Oh. Because everybody talks about Rhaegar Mm. and how perfect Rhaegar was, and you guys Mm -hmm. know that I just love, I love Rhaegar. Yeah, Yeah, but for him it was justified, though. Like, I feel like in this situation, I feel what Robin Hobb did really, really nicely is the way she's established her world, it in, in itself enables poeticism and metaphorical complexities because of like you know people having to be named after virtues and shit like that that yeah. in itself gives leeways to things that work really well and things that also completely contradict what the character is actually doing as per their name and i feel like in the case of chivalry it's not really very chivalrous of a visit to like leave no. his kid. Mm. <laughs> really it's not really chivalrous no. for him to have a kid outside of his marriage Jesus. See, I, wanted, right? I, I know <laughs> want to know i want to know more about him like i wanted to know more about rhaegar because the parallel that I drew is that both of these characters were supposed to be so great, but we only know that they're so great from what other people have mm-hmm. said about them because mm-hmm. we never actually see their account and we never actually see them doing anything. So I, I want to know why everybody loves shiv- chivalry so much. Like, why? what did he do that was so great? Like, why? I feel like there's more story and it's possibly it could come up, like, I have no idea, um, about how he did end up with a bastard. Like is is there a yeah. story there, yeah. or was uh, was he just like any other guy? Somebody called Stephanie in the comments has just said that it's hard to love chivalry because we don't know him. But it's also interesting if you think not only are we hearing everything about chivalry from other people's like what they've said, this is also Fitz's perspective. He's the one telling the story, so it's not just what other people have said. We're getting it through what Fitz is telling us that other people have said. We've got two layers between what we know is happening and. Mm. Yeah, the first hand account yeah what do we actually that's an interesting point what do we feel about the parallel between with Ashley saying that it's coming from Fitz's perspective the narrative so how do we feel about the parallel between Fitz's perspective on his father and Fitz's perspective of Boric who is the man who is essentially his father I am um, so I love chivalry and it's like, we never actually meet chivalry on the page. So it's just really bizarre to love a character that you never actually have met. But part of it, I feel like, could also stem from like, maybe if you look at it from like, Fitz is semi-adopted by Burrich. And so he feels lost on behalf of his birth father and never getting to have a connection. And you hear, I mean, my mother was adopted. So you hear lots of adoption stories where this sense of um, where do they come from is a big part of their identity and, and always searching. Um, so for me, because I love Fitz so much and just like him trying to make these connections to chivalry and maybe the things that he builds chivalry up to be in his head or the things that he hears from Birch constantly about chivalry um, has built this character uh, for me that, that makes me love chivalry. But um, I, I w- I'm also gonna give a shout out to Lady Patience because she stays with chivalry. She stays with chivalry until chivalry's death. And then she still tries to find it in her heart to bring Fitz into her life. Even though she, you, you never get a lady patient's perspective or point of view, but I can only imagine like the first thoughts that she would have had about Fitz and discovering his existence, but then still trying to make sure that he lives up to his father's name and make sure that he's educated well. And so, you know, 
I think you brought up a really, really interesting point, which to me kind of usually triggers the idea of good writing is like when the writer, it, like the book doesn't start where the book starts literally on the page. Mm -hmm. It starts way beforehand. And it gives a sense of the idea that this world is living and breathing and there's a lot of stuff still happening. And like there's a lot of um, tricks and whatnot's happening under the scenes and whatnot. And so like just you know that idea that you wish you were a fly on the wall in that conversation and how she reacted to it and everything I feel mm -hmm. like that really I, like, I don't know I like that liveliness in the chat we have some discourse about whether Fitz was fathered before or after chivalry was married does anybody have a definitive answer I think it was after if I remember I correctly but he had already been married to Lady Patience yeah, we have um, we have the question: Was he was he conceived <laughs> before or after? But then directly after after that, somebody's put after, and somebody else has put before. So <laughs> the only thing you really get timeline wise is I can't remember which character it is, but someone works out how old he is when they first get dropped off, and it's just like it was that woman, and then they just there isn't any other mention, and it's like what woman? <laughs> like, are we going to find out who his mother is at some point? I don't know. This is where Cody and Cass are just like looking like oh, you, you, you say something? I wasn't listening, huh? <laughs> so oh, there's so much I want to tell I know, you, but I, know. I can't. I know. <laughs> really? What you need to know. No. I am ex I'm excited to find out where it goes, but I'm a little bit scared. I don't like being like outside of the knowledge. Like I want to know what's going on. <laughs> yeah. I'm just excited to hear all your theories, honestly, during this live show about what's going to happen. I still um, don't know how it ends, though. Like, I'm, I'm, oh, I'm, I'm in the last trilogy right now, so I don't know how this whole thing's going to end. Yeah. I have are so the, much to go. <laughs> are the other two trilogies that follow Fitz from his perspective? Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. So it's just like a continuation with other series yeah. in between. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. I mean, I'm every excited. Time, yeah. really excited. Every time we get back into a Fitz trilogy, it's all from his perspective. Oh. Um, we touched on the character of Patience. I don't trust her. I don't like her because <laughs> she's the reason why Chivalry left, or well, we believe that she is. We didn't get much on it, but that is what we believe, that he left because of her. So why would she come back? It feels like she's just clinging on to Chivalry, and it's like, well, you could have... This is all your fault. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's because like maybe she came back because it's yeah. her like maid servant. I don't know mm. who was like she regrets making him leave because initially it was out of jealousy because she couldn't have a child. Mm -hmm. and she was mm -hmm. like, "Well, we don't want this one," <laughs> and then she regretted it the entire time. Apparently, and she is also the reason that everything else happened. Technically, because if Chivalry hadn't have left, then they wouldn't have been fighting over the throne. The thing that makes me suspicious is that she's quite literally called patient, so her leaving for. <laughs> is that mm. what you'd be waiting for? <laughs> that's a that's a very good point. I didn't think of it in terms tea of that. sis, go off sis. That's a real good tea right there. That's piping, actually. <laughs> I didn't think about it like that. Um, so should we talk about the characters that everybody hates? So the first one. <laughs> yeah. That's the first one. He's the one that I hated. No, actually, I hate Regal the most. Oh yeah. <laughs> Because Galen or Galen, like he is, like you, he, he's never pretended to be good or anything. Not that Regal has, but Regal's supposed to be a prince, yeah, and like he's really, yeah. he's really creepy about it. Like he's slimy. I don't like mm -hmm. Regal at all. Can we say Joffrey for a hundred <laughs> points? Thanks. Just say like not, not like the same, but like. <laughs> I would say that they both have about the same IQ. <laughs> LOL. <laughs> um, I'd say that Joffrey's a little bit more torturous, but yeah. Um, so let's start with I, everybody. Ev oh, I'm just sorry, just like so many trains of thought. Um, it says Galen had major little finger vibes for me. Mm. See, that I is thought Galen I'm... was a simplistic bastard, but yeah, no, I don't think he, was he could be trying to present yeah. himself as one, though. Yeah. Becca mm. originally is adding back, <laughs> just in case she does. Oh, oh. <laughs> hey. Hi. So. <laughs> right, so uh, going with Little Finger Vibes. I can, I can, I can see that. I can, yeah. They're both kind of conniving, but then Galen's more brutal. 
like just straight up. <laughs> I think my my issue with like disliking Regal more is that with Gallon, like I never, I was never under any other idea than he was going yeah. to be horrible. So when he was horrible, I wasn't surprised. So mm-hmm. I was prepared for that. But Regal, like I didn't know if anything was actually going to happen with Regal or whether he was just going to be um, whiny and petulant. Mm-hmm. So he he annoyed me more, but um, obviously mm-hmm. we have the learning of the skill. Now I don't believe for one second that Fitz does not have much skill. Should we say with the skill? Because mm-hmm. um, I think that the way that he was trained, he was set up for failure, and I think that Fitz is being a little bit naive in thinking. But he was manipulated. Um, into believing that he didn't have have any mastery over it but I yeah I think he's being a little bit naive in not acknowledging that he was set up for failure mm-hmm. kind of thing with mm-hmm. that because of the way that Gallon triggered him like everyone learns differently but you're not gonna learn when you feel like shit about yourself no. consistently yeah. you know like nothing is going into your brain other than your own perpetual state of depression yeah and it's he was interesting. also being singled out yeah, it's interesting as well that Gallon wasn't even supposed to be skill master. It's just that there wasn't enough time to train yeah. anybody else. Yeah. 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 And I mean, yeah. Verity and Chivalry were, were taught in a very different way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So mm-hmm. that's not And it has a ripple effect on the rest of like the skill coterie um, and mm-hmm. the skill users in Buckkeep. Just like this poisonous person that wasn't supposed to be in charge of everybody is in charge of everybody and affects the magic moving forward. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. While we're talking about him, actually, was anybody actually surprised that he's the Queen's bastard? I wasn't surprised, but I also didn't see it coming, but I never see anything coming. So <laughs> I yeah. saw it coming when they were talking about how obsessed he was with, mm-hmm. who's he obsessed with? And he was like the the queen's right hand man, like the queen had done all this stuff for him and made him like a mm-hmm. part of cause. So mm-hmm. I was like, yeah. with mm-hmm. how she was acting up at the beginning of the book, like there is not a chance mm-hmm. that um, mm-hmm. he's not her bastard. Mm-hmm. There's bastard. What do you guys <laughs> think about? Um, what do you guys think about Regal not having the skill and also Shrewd no longer having the skill? I wasn't sure what to think about Shrewd. Um, mm. Regal, see, I don't, I think the magic is not, because it's from Fitz's perspective and Fitz doesn't really know very much, I don't Mm -hmm. have a full grasp of the magic system yet, Mm -hmm. so it's hard for me to kind of say how I felt, because like, I was just kind of taking everything as, to be fair, had been in the perspective of Fitz made me react to everything like he does, so like, I was told information. I was like, oh, yeah, okay. I just didn't think anything <laughs> of it like he does. Yeah. I have to say, I kind of like that. Like, just going back to the previous conversation, I kind of um, hated Galen more simply because I liked Regal for being a cunt. Does that make sense? <laughs> it's like when a character's so dislikable, but it's like well done, I'm just like, hmm. And the fact that he doesn't have the skill kind of says to me, he has to think of more conniving ways to be a little dick. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and I find yeah. I find that weirdly exciting. It's almost like they do something awful and you're like, you know what, fair play. <laughs> <laughs> I think the reason, one of the reasons that I don't like Regal as well is that he's got so much swagger and he's got nothing to back it up. And that, yeah. like, I have no respect for him because of that. Yeah. Like, if he was going to be awful, but could actually back it up, then I'd be like, you know what, fair play. But he just doesn't know. He's just mm-hmm. a weak little slimy fool. And I do he's not like him. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, it's uh, it's interesting. I am intrigued to see if there's any crossover. I don't know if this was just like a random train of thought. If there's any crossover between the skill and the wit, because they're presented as two very different things. Like the skill is this prized thing that the royal family have. Meanwhile, Jorik's literally trying to not well, trying to be out of him, but every time he does the wit part of side like side of things. That's seen as a bad thing and something that continued basically, but I'm like, as far as I can tell from what we've been told about it, they are very similar because they both involve mm-hmm. going into some like a living thing's mind. Mm-hmm. I'm like, what <laughs> makes these different? I know Cass wanted to talk about the skill and the wit a little bit, but I only realized when I did my wrap up the other day how similar they are. They are exactly the same thing, apart from one is people, one is animals. And it mm-hmm. took 
it took me until I was articulating it in a video to actually like get that. <laughs> That's exactly the same. Um, doing it on like trying it on people. So I'm like, has he been doing the skill all along? Or? <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that like? Could... Yeah, go go ahead. Yeah, go. I just mostly brought it up because I wanted to hear everybody's thoughts on it. And now I have like too much knowledge of like backstory of of <laughs> yeah. skill wit that I don't want to like get too ahead of the discussion. But I just want to hear what everybody else. Mm -hmm. thinks. Yeah, I'm just same. gonna say this real quick. Like, it kind of reminded. Okay, there's this one spell in The Witcher <laughs> <laughs> where, like, girl goes shoo, and like <laughs> anyone who's like, like, I'm really mad at him, they're like, oh, you know, and then like he can kind of make them do things. I don't know. So it reminded me of that, but like, it works on animals. Mm -hmm. But that that's it. I just wanted. To put I'm interested to see whether they are actually different or whether it is just the same thing applied differently. Mm -hmm. Did anyone um, see the Burrick reveal coming? Anyone? I absolutely saw it coming because he protested <laughs> far too much to Fitz about it being the worst thing in the world. Uh -huh. Yeah. He never use it. And I was just like, you you hate this far too much and you're so impassioned by it mm -hmm. for you mm -hmm. to not have a strong connection with it. I mm -hmm. felt like I did see it come in only because Boric knows immediately when Fitz is doing mm -hmm. something. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't know, once again, with being in Fitz's perspective, I didn't know whether it was something that we were kind of supposed to just know mm. or whether it would actually be revealed. But obviously later on it did. We did actually get a reveal on that. Um, it's very interesting the way that Boric then tries to stop Fitz from doing it mm -hmm. because he could have sat him down and said, like, look, I have this thing too. This happened to me. Maybe don't do it because it's all just going to go wrong. But instead, he just went a completely... <laughs> 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 well, completely the wrong way about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, smacking him. Um, <laughs> what did you think, actually, while we're talking about Boric, about the fact that he didn't actually kill Nosy and the fact that Fitz just automatically assumed that he had? I hated him most for the longest time because you do not <laughs> separate a man from his dog, mm. let alone a boy <laughs> from his dog. Are you mad? Like, but then at the end, I was like, okay, cool. And then that happens, and I'm like, yeah, <laughs> you really brought this motherfucker back just for that. Okay, go on, I guess. <laughs> I um wait, what was the original question? No, I forgot. Um Burek not killing no Yeah, thing. the fact that he didn't kill him, but oh, yeah. automatically assumed that he did. Um I just like that because Bert like it's not his child. He is raising Fitz because he made a promise to Verity, his best friend, um, his king, right? So the, all the mistakes that he is making, they're they're just like kind of like first time parent mistakes to a man that never intended to be a parent. And so him like not killing Nosy, also he just loves animals. So I I don't think he would have it in him just to kill a pup because of uh, Fitz's connection to the pup. Like he he always has a decision and a process um, that he makes with his animals. So it would just be totally out of character for him to kill an animal that like had no reason to be killed there was not lame it was not sick you know just connected to fits but see i felt that but with not really understanding how any of the magic systems work <laughs> i wasn't sure <laughs> <laughs> i wasn't I'm having sure. the worst time i'm so sorry like just let you know basically my laptop has completely died and the charge isn't working so we're using my mobile phone pops up on books so i'm really sorry uh, <laughs> I'll let we stand the dedication sis <laughs> um yeah with not knowing how the wit and the skill worked i didn't know how the connection could have been severed without killing Nosy. So that was what made me question it. It did seem weird for him to do it, but without any knowledge of the magic system, I just didn't understand how it could have could have worked. Mm -hmm. I think it's an interesting one because I think it might be Amanda say so definitely didn't kill didn't kill Nosy because he loves animals yeah. too much. But I think that makes it even more interesting or just proves how good the writing is because if we just thought about it longer than like reading it, mm -hmm. we would have figured that out ourselves. But because we're reading yeah. it from a six year old's perspective, all he knew was that Nosy had gone and he couldn't kill him anymore. So that automatically means he is gone. Yeah. And because it's from 
that's been his thought since he was that young. It's not really something you'd want to touch back on long enough to really consider anything else or think about it in depth. And it's like, even Burek says towards the end when he's like, oh, you honestly thought that, like, no wonder you thought I was a monster this entire time. Mm -hmm. And then I even think Fritz is like, well, actually, because, oh, is it Burek? He says something like, oh, how could you think I would do that? Like, I love animals. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and it's like, oh, yeah. But because it is so young and he's so young when he comes up with this belief, mm -hmm. no reason to go back mm -hmm. to it because it's such a bad thing that he's obviously affected by it and you don't really want to return to it long enough to consider any other possibility really yeah. it does make me question the scientific kind of physics aspect of the magic system like at mm. what distance does the the break happen does that make sense mm. Mm. and like stuff like that and like does it take more magic power out of you to use the wit versus the skill you know like does that make sense Especially because um with his what's the other dog called that he has um spacey oh yeah mm. mm -hmm. yeah with that one he senses its lifespan when he's really far away. So it's like, what was the difference? Was it an age thing? And because he didn't know how to use it as much, or because obviously mm. this seems to be able to span miles and miles and miles because we've seen it happen. So why did it break when he took like Burek took Nosy away just like down the road? <laughs> It could have been that maybe he, like, you know, that's a very valid point, like, that maybe he just wasn't proficient enough in the magic to be able to utilise it properly when he was at you. Well, perhaps Burrick stopped him if he can yeah. use the wit as well. Yeah, And I mean, he was in the mountains as well. He was all the way with the uh -huh. Ke Keter, you know, the brother. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so many names, I will admit, like, I struggled. Like, I'm struggling mm -hmm. now to remember all the names of all the different characters, mm -hmm. especially because they have abstract, abstract names, a lot of them, like <laughs> the names of the virtues. Mm -hmm. uh, so like, there are a lot of them. Mm -hmm. I want people to have names of sins, to just come in and make it, like, really cool and edgy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Someone literally comes in called Rath, and it's like, oh, God. <laughs> I mean, it is so ominous, exactly. Just so, imagine Wit versus Wrath, like, ooh. ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody um, put in the chat that Fitz is definitely an unreliable narrator, and, like, he 100% is, but I think it's so hard to believe that he is. I'm definitely a very unassuming reader. Like, I can read into things in terms of guessing what the plot's going to be and what twists are coming. But I, like, the same as a person, actually, like, if you say something, I take it as law. So if a character tells me something, I believe it. And then if it's contradicted later, I'm like, but you told me. Especially if it's the character <laughs> that you're reading from. Like, if you're reading from the perspective of a character, you trust them. Mm. So it's hard to, like, reconcile that with Fitz being unreliable. Not because he's being misleading, but just because he's young. I think that really ties into why I really disliked Kavoth because I don't think he's unreliable. He was just OP and it pissed me off <laughs> because why am I going to like, I'm not redacting from the suffering this character goes through. And like, like I, I, I still stand by my earlier point, but the problem is with Kavoth is literally like, yeah, I went through some shitty times. But I came out and was a badass. Like, <laughs> I don't care about you then. You literally did nothing. And meanwhile, and like you literally won every battle. You were fine all the time. Meanwhile, I really appreciated this character suffered in like so many spheres and things actually happened and it actually led to something happening and it feels like everything is working in the grand scale of things to actually produce some kind of actual narrative rather than I'm a badass, this is what I did and this is what I did. Like this isn't Skyrim, Skyrim like this is not a side quest yeah. in Skyrim which is hella boring, this is like the main quest and I like that. Mm. I literally, I need to do like a Name of the Wind read along and have you as a host just so I can... I'll just bitch about it the entire time. <laughs> I do find it interesting thinking about the time frame and this is purely like one of the little things I noticed because I read along with the audiobook and mm. I don't know whether it's a UK versus US thing or whatever but the audiobook ages up the character I think it is yeah so there's oh, yeah it ages it up so there's a shorter time span because the ending age isn't bumped it's just the beginning <laughs> so I was like does it make any difference to like, would you see things as less believable if he was younger, older, if the time frame of him doing all these things and learning all these things was shorter? Because I think from what the ages were, like, he he had a much shorter amount of time. There must have been about two years knocked off of the timeline in the audiobook compared to the actual book that I was reading. Hmm. 
And I just don't know if that... It didn't make any difference to me. I just thought it was interesting. Like, why would they would do that? Why would they age him up? I felt like you... In my brain, it was, like, ages, like, 6 to 14 or something like yeah. that. Yeah. He's 13 or 14. Yeah. He's 13 when he... Uh, with the assassin like when he starts the assassin training i think yeah to me like at the end he's in and uh, like hogwarts 30th basically <laughs> like, <laughs> because one of the things i've tabbed is a thing about the man ceremony so when mm -hmm. they turn 14 they have to go through the ceremony and they're claimed by someone mm -hmm. so he at least ends 14 but yeah i think it's one. quite telling as well that one of the reasons that boric can tell that he has the wit is because he is seems more mature for his age because he has all these other senses already that he was born with mm -hmm. from bonding with animals but what did y'all think of his name like the name that he's given <laughs> Cass is like <laughs> <laughs> i like it was it verity that gave him the name as well mm -hmm. I, the name. Mm -hmm. yeah i but their relationship as well like it's really like i kind of wish that verity had done more for him because mm -hmm. he kind mm -hmm. of liked him, but at the same time, kind of didn't care. It was like he like he had nothing against him, but he didn't care enough to like step up for him, kind of thing. Like he did in ways. Um, I really liked it where Verity was using the skill and where he's really drained, and like him and Fitz were bonding during that time. Um, and I really like to see that kind of relationship that they were developing then. I don't know how far that's going to go in the books because I don't know where the next books are going at all mm -hmm. um but i did like those aspects in the book and i liked that fitz finally got a name because it was such a big deal that he didn't have one for him yeah this entire time how I cute like it, was it as a combination well. of like fitz which is you know the whole thing and then in the end it's like well here you go like kiss it yeah. like thing towards your dad you know <laughs> isn't that cute and it's like his dad seems great we still don't know that shit about him all right then i guess like it, it was hot what's interesting is that fits actually just means son of and it's only a snide thing when you just say fit so this entire time they have quite literally been mm -hmm. holding the bastard mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. chivalry mm -hmm. on the on the end change the entire mm -hmm. definition to the son of chivalry mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. rather than just Bastard. <laughs> I wasn't actually talking about that name though. I was talking about Catalyst. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Why are you all like... doing this then? Why are you all bringing it up if you're going to tease us like that? <laughs> I, I want to hear your theories. I want to hear theories. I don't yeah. make theories. I'm really crap at seeing anything. <laughs> I feel like when he masters his art, he's going to do some bad bitch shit. And everyone's going to be like, damn, we shouldn't have treated him bad because now we feel like dickheads. And he's probably going to save everyone in some epic way. Like that, I'm like, this is a massive theory. So obviously something's going to go down somewhere. <laughs> it's like, it's I gonna... just don't know. Like, <laughs> because we had the thing with the Raiders. And mm -hmm. I'm wondering if the history of the Raiders is going to be tied in because all of the people of the place where they all live originally came from the Outer Islanders, I believe from mm. reading those little snippets at the beginning. Um, so they do have lineage there. So I'm interested. That magic actually just remembered the weird magic that they're doing. Mm -hmm. I imagine that that is going to be central to the plot of the series. But I was kind of thrown with the big, I guess we're an hour in, we should probably talk about like the end of the book and the events that go down there because that threw me because I expected these raiders to be the main presence and the mm. plot to climax there but it was really like a big political thing with this mountain princess mm. so with like those two prominent plot lines i can't really make any theories because i have no idea which way like what the main plot events are going to be for the series kind of thing mm. i feel like it's sorry go, go ashley i was just gonna say the whole thing with the mountain princess like the marriage was made to kind of make their forces better against the raiders so that could be a potential thing for the next book because we have a shift in allegiances and different things like that so that's a possible strand but i don't know how big it's going to become but i think because of the magic side it is going to be bigger than just people raiding because it's a bit weird mm -hmm. I think the idea of something called a catalyst like really goes down into the idea of like it can go two ways. You could be a catalyst for good or you could be a catalyst for bad. And like it could mm. be this 
cast Dom. <laughs> it, it could be kind of like you would think that he's going to be a catalyst for progress, but then inadvertently he causes something. Uh, this is like prediction <laughs> at Andy right now, okay? But like he he like causes something he doesn't mean to, or yet he's like stuck in a crossroads and he goes with something that he seems like right at the time, but he doesn't think with the foresight. And like to me, especially with the, the, the literal ending, this idea of lamentation and grief, I feel like that might follow into the next books. And that's why it's expressed so heavily in this ending. <laughs> Was it the fool that said as long as they keep him alive, there's more options, and that's the only reason that he was like <laughs> telling him anything. <laughs> he was just—he never said that they were, it was a good thing. It was just like we just have more options if you're alive. <laughs> so I'm like, um, people okay. are asking in the chat what they want, what what we think about the fool. Um, honestly, you. I cannot work out riddles to save my life, so I just. <laughs> Everything he said went right over my head. Even when he said the riddle, like the first riddle he said, and then Fitz went and did the thing that was the riddle, I still couldn't work out how the riddle yeah, was really... what he did. <laughs> no, I didn't really get that. He just said his name in multiple different ways, and then he was like, oh, I did a thing. And I... <laughs> he made a sentence, and I got the sentence, and then the chapter was called something where it actually happened that related to the sentence. But I still couldn't make the riddle make sense. <laughs> but I'm just really bad at riddles. I feel like Cass and Cody are probably looking at us like now, like, damn, <laughs> y'all don't know. It's going to come in later and you're going to feel so dumb. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I understand that. Yeah. <laughs> I am really Cody's great about yes, riddles. No, <laughs> but I love the fool. Um, love. I just love the fool's loyalty. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'll, I'll say about the fool. Mm -hmm. There's some shocking things to come with the fool. Is one of the trilogies called The Fits and the Fool? That's the very last one. Okay, like, there's yeah. quite a few books that are like Fool's Quest and Fool's Yada Yada. Yeah, so. that's the last one. And then, well, um, that's uh, the Tawny Man trilogy, which is uh, we got the yeah. fool. So, do we, do we yeah, more looking ahead about the fool in the next one. Do we get more insights there, or is that later on? You get so much fool moving forward. I did kind of like him because yeah. I like <laughs> he has that vibe that I normally see when I read books about fairies where like he's being a dick but he's mm -hmm. like he mm -hmm. knows it and like he gets really exasperated mm -hmm. with people yeah. so I really like that energy about him <laughs> yeah. where he's just like why are you all so stupid yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he reminds me a lot of the wit or Hoyd from Sanderson's books so y'all will read those and then you can see yeah. what I mean by that interesting okay. which Sanderson books? Uh, the wit Hoyd? Hoyd. I'm like, have you read Stormlight? I haven't. Okay. That's where I'm at right now. I've read everything up to Stormlight and not yet Stormlight. So you'll know, you'll kind of know, but you won't know okay. yet. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Just need to highlight this comment. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, with that, Adam T. I kind yeah. of assumed at some point that he's just repressing memories and he doesn't want to acknowledge whatever it is that happened before he turned mm -hmm. up. Um, but it is annoying. I think that's one of the biggest issues with this type of storytelling is that how in the f word did you remember this? Because that's the most boring crap. Like, you're literally in a world surrounded by royals and politics and magic, and you're out here remembering what people ate for breakfast. Come on now. <laughs> and yet you can't, like, explicitly explain the magic system. Come on now. <laughs> so just the general events of the end of the book. Anybody have anything specific to say on what actually went down there? Because there was quite a few reveals. We did have the Boric reveal. I think that was then that we've talked about. Um, we also found out about Regal being yeah. the bastard. Just that moment, that moment where he finally got what he deserved. I was so happy. And also the moment where, was it Fitz that skilled to Verity and told Verity what was going on and then Verity turned on Galen? I absolutely mm -hmm. just loved yeah. that moment. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, it was a very twisty plot with the assassination. And the I want to way... hear what you guys think of Shrewd. What do you think? Because he seems to have, you know, no lots of things. So do you think he's, what are his, his motives and stuff at the end of the book? He feels like a Varys character mm. for me. I think he's very stoic. 
Mm. I can't really get a read on him because he does seem to be quite blank emotionally. Like he's all about what's best for the kingdom, but like he's mm -hmm. very, he withholds information and only gives people the information that they need. And everything is quite matter of fact. Like I don't think he ever said anything about how he was feeling at all or gave any indication about how he was feeling at any given moment through things that he was saying. I've just looked up the definition of shrewd. Mm -hmm. and looking at the Middle English one, which is the same as where the origin of bits came from, it means evil person or thing. <laughs> so like, <laughs> we finally have the seven deadly sins kind of bad. <laughs> wow. It was cunning. So I'm just like, shrewd. <laughs> what are you up to? Mm -hmm. It's interesting. I like as soon as his they... relationship with the fool too, though. Mm -hmm. I just, I just don't understand the fool. Like, I just don't get it. I want to. I, I like. I know it's because it's the first <laughs> book. Because I do know that he plays like such a big part in the series as a whole. Mm -hmm. But he's just so intriguing, and I just want to know more about him. And it's really frustrating, especially because I'm not reading the next book this month. I'm only going to read it next month. Yeah. yeah. Like, I just want there's so much that I want to know because I know it's all going to be really clever when everything comes together and how everything's fed together all this time. And it's mm -hmm. so frustrating reading the first book in a fantasy series. <laughs> rereading it, like rereading it as well. I picked up on so many more clues that I missed the first time mm -hmm. I read it. So it's just a joy to reread. And I immediately wanted to pick up the second one after I was finished, and I was like. Like, no, I can't. It's owls. I haven't got time for this shit. But <laughs> anybody else have that where they were like, okay, I need to pick up the next I book? I could have very well just gone straight into it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it's because of the way I feel about coming of age fantasies as well. It's like, okay, you've told me this part of your life. No, I just, I could just carry on and just like yeah. keep going. Mm -hmm. like, this is the juicy bit. part, like the 16 year old. But no, uh, so do you like think, Cody, it rewards rereading? Yes. Okay. Like, do you I'm, think it was written in that way to reward rereading or for you to, like, be able to kind of see how everything comes together in the later part? Does that make well, sense? Well, I've only read the first trilogy, the Farsia trilogy, so there's going to be a lot probably that I haven't even picked up on from later mm -hmm. books, mm -hmm. perhaps. I don't know yet. But I feel mm -hmm. like the further I get into it, the more joy it's going to have in the reread, mm -hmm. probably. Yeah. Somebody said to me that in later books, there's characters that, I barely even mentioned in this one that become really important. So now I'm just suspicious of everybody. Exactly. <laughs> like, who is, who is going to become important? Why? <laughs> and I think, like, I do think it's rewarding to do the reread. I'm really excited for the live ship reread because um, there was just so many things that I completely did not pick up on until the very end reveals of some of those books. And I was like, uh, what was I reading this whole time? Because I didn't pick up on that. So I'm excited to reread that one. But as you get further and further along into Fitz's life, like right now I'm reading Fitz's like 60, um, he does reflect a lot back into this time too. So it is almost kind of like a reread where mm -hmm. you're like getting his perspectives as an older man of how he was acting as like an eight year old running around the castle. So yeah, it's fun. Cute, I'm excited to, ca to just really read them cute. all. <laughs> I was wondering how far the series went. So I'm guessing like um, the middle trilogy is his like, 20s no um he probably ends up like mid 20s at the end of assassin's quest oh, i thought this like, would be like up until like 20 and then he'd be like 20s and 30s and then i think he's like i read him as like 30s and 40s in the middle trilogy interesting but I like we, this... we established that i probably haven't been a great judge of age because i was reading for <laughs> his like 60 but i yeah. i believe like he was probably much younger because of Verity and, and Chivalry were not that old, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I feel like this this uh, trilogy wraps up really well as well as its own separate thing. So it's mm -hmm. not like you finish it and you're like, oh man, I'm gonna be reading Live Ship Traders now. I can't wait to get back to the Fits and the Fall because it's, uh -huh. it's nice and contained still. I you was surprised that, Cody, But in multiple of your videos, you keep saying, I need to read the Live Ship Traders, but I just wanna read about the Fits and the Fall. <laughs> <laughs> Because you just miss Fitz. That's what I felt like. I just <laughs> missed him. Yeah, you do. you do. But it is. It's it's satis It's a satisfying trilogy. I think on its own. It's so interesting how much we're talking about the fool though, and where that perspective is going to be like a major part of it. It seems like. Mm. I don't know. Mm. I'm just. I'm more intrigued about that to see where that is going. Mm -hmm. I think with me knowing that it's like it's is it it's sixteen books, isn't it? 
in total the entire thing yes with me knowing that there's so many books i'm kind of just like looking at the first book kind of surface level because i know that the things that are actually relevant aren't really going to be too present in mm -hmm. the first book because it's all just going to build off this first book mm -hmm. but like i don't think i've read i don't think i've read a series this big before and i especially have not no. read an adult fantasy series this big so the scope of what this series is going to be is just blowing my mind it wets my noodle a lot the <laughs> idea of really but i think it, it's yeah. very like easily digestible because like sanderson mm. can feel really big because he made it big right mm. but robin hobb just remember like each of the Fitz trilogies center us back around Fitz. So the scope of the world can be big, but you can get that comfort that like we're centered on Fitz again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. I'm really excited to see just what the magic system's like, because as we've already established, there seems to be parallels between wit and skill, but there might not be, that might grow into mm -hmm. something else. But then there's also what the raiders can do with the forging. Mm -hmm. And then there's also the fool who seems to have some sort of clairvoyant prediction abilities. And I'm like, I wonder how all these fit together or if it's just going to be like, yeah, these people can just do this thing or. Like, yeah. that's what I'm also like kind of hoping for. I feel like yeah. because we're seeing his age range from like a very limited perspective, like he hasn't really got the op opportunity to explore much or anything like that. I'm hoping that there's other kinds of magic that kind of come up. Mm. That's just something I'm slightly hoping for. I wouldn't be disappointed. Okay, I would be a little bit disappointed. I would be very disappointed. <laughs> but I'm hoping. Because I feel like <laughs> there could be so much more nuances, especially with the spectrum of like physical kinds of magic and then mental kinds of magic and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I'm just really excited for you all to read the last book in this trilogy, man. Because it's going to be good. Oh. It's going to be so good. Somebody has asked how old the school is. <laughs> we don't actually oh, we don't know. know. Like, still don't even know. Because um, he does, doesn't does fit say a lot in the book that he can't place him age-wise because like, sometimes he looks really young and sometimes he looks really old. Yeah. I mean, because Zaf just said about... Mm, sorry, Rach, go ahead. No, 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 it's okay. Okay. Because um, Zaf said about more magic, I'm wondering... Like, I'm guessing that he has like a different kind of magic. I'm not sure whether he just has like oracle kind of powers um, or whether he does have a type of magic. I don't know why... Anyone who's read Nevernight, it reminds me of the brother and sister. Is oh, really? Albino? I think it's because he's albino. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Albino and being able to. Yeah. Yeah. I was just like. Okay, my dumbass, I'm not going to lie, I was kind of imagining like a really pale, this is going to sound so dumb. So I was thinking Fitz and Fool, right? And then in my head, I was, it, again, it just made me think of Geralt and Yaskier. So even though Yaskier is nothing like the Fool, I was just visualizing that mm. face. I love Does that make too. sense? Mm -hmm. Just because the tell. idea of a Fool just makes me think of that. I keep telling Ashley that she's the Yaskier to my Geralt, but she doesn't know what it means. <gasps> <laughs> I see it. I I see that. Yeah, because Ashley sings a lot, and she's like really bouncy, and I'm just like, yeah. get the fuck away from me and sit down. <laughs> <laughs> okay, can I be Jennifer in this like allegory? Yeah. Like, I'm absolutely not? Jennifer. <laughs> oh, Yen, we do love her. Yeah. Um, does well, anybody have yeah. anything? I'm going to take some questions from the chat, probably. So if I you have anything in the chat that you want to know, just say hi. Come oh, on. come here, come here, come on up. Can you see her? No, no. 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 Lona, come here. <laughs> so cute. I love her. Oh, <laughs> she looks a lot like my dog as well. So I see. Yeah. Her. Like oh. 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 Okay, okay, you're still in the show. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what do we think of Shade? Of Jade or Harvey Pouncer? Oh, God, yeah, and the whole assassin thing. Wow, okay. <laughs> Not called Assassin's Apprentice or anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, that is kind of a minor part of the, like, he's doing the assassin's work and stuff. But with everything else going on, I felt like the assassin training kind of faded into the background, aside from the fact that he was bonded yeah. with. Is it shade or is it shade? I want to say it's shade. I would say shade. Yeah. Shade. Mm. See, I, I go shade. Just shade, but then I was like, it makes more sense to be called shade if you're an assassin. <laughs> well, yeah. I thought like I read it as shade, and I'm like, but he's an assassin, so shade makes sense. Mm. <laughs> I did yeah. like his little games with shade. Um, 
and just like rem like that kind of stuff i wish we had gotten more of but i was also fine with like the amount that was in this book and i loved the little assassin's tunnels and the little stairwell to get up to shade's room and mm -hmm. yeah i loved mm -hmm. all of that even though there's not a lot of actual assassin eating mm -hmm. Going I on. forgot about the part with the knife in the fireplace, like the, oh, yeah. and I was like, yes, I forgot <laughs> about that. I love that. Oh, yeah. Oh, that was such a badass moment. I mm -hmm. feel like the kind of titular element is more so like maybe this is where, like, being in the position where he was Trade's apprentice is where he felt the most comfortable and most at home. And the biggest mm -hmm. part of his, like, like, those years established his character and his role in things. So, that, like, that's kind of how I read the title, if that makes sense. Mm. We have. Does anyone else feel like it was swept under the rug that his place as an assassin was a little blown just so he could keep being an assassin in the future? Um, because he was talking about like killing people and stuff. And what happened at the end? Everybody found out that he's an assassin as well, didn't they? Actually, yeah. So I'm like, how does he? How does he go on? Like if everybody knows that he's an assassin now, Wait, I know that he. Was, I think he complained about it and was like, "Oh, well, everybody knows, so like I can't be an assassin anymore." Yeah, Regal has a big mouth. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> I mean his circle of people isn't that big ever. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So. Yeah, a lot of them are dead now as well. That either that, that new there at the end is either killed off or just in the mm -hmm. royal family. So it yeah, doesn't matter. Yeah. Too. <laughs> Uh -huh. Um. Oh God, I had something that. Oh, how did we feel about finding out that that old woman was Shade? <laughs> oh yeah, Lady Time. I love <laughs> her. I love her so much. <laughs> she got to the bit, and then it was like, it, he said that he had to go and see her because she wasn't feeling well. And then she says, "Come into the room." And he goes into the room, and then Shade's there. And I was just reading, and then I was like, "Wait a minute, why is Shade here?" <laughs> And then I went back and I was like, why is Shade in the room? And I was like, oh my god, no, Shade is the woman. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and he's also the pocked man, so he just takes on all. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> People say he is, and I'm like, wow, man of many talents. Mm. Do we think yeah. What did you think to, sorry, yeah. what did you think to him being the um, king's brother, bastard brother? I kind of saw that as well. Did you? Yeah. <laughs> just assume everyone's a bastard at this point. <laughs> yeah. I got you know, the only thing that I really guessed was all the bastards. Like I knew, <laughs> yeah. I knew who was who's bastard. <laughs> I don't know. Shade, shade just reminds me of the, like the many-faced man, and like mm. of, like Game of Thrones. Mm. 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 Do we think that there is a correlation between him being called the? Is it the pocked man that's like the omen, like the death omen? Yeah. yeah. Is mm. there any actual correlation in the history prior to the actual the actual start of the book that would lead people to believe that he is the pocked man kind of thing, aside from just his appearance? I mean, it's interesting that he's an assassin and seen as a death omen, but I suppose that's mm. too simple. <laughs> that's why I'm like, is this some foreshadowing that he's like mistaken yeah. as being? I feel like the history has to be death. more relevant because every single chapter is part of like a history book. Mm. I mm. felt like the forging was more impactful to the community than the death omen, right? Mm. The, um, I just don't understand the forging. I don't even like have anything to really say about it because I literally just do not understand what's going on there yet. Mm. So when I was reading the synopsis of like the live ship traders, the main synopsis is, is talking about is it not talking about the forged ones in that, or is that one not part of it? Have I just mixed up the stories? Um, because I thought the forged ones were also part of the Live Ship Traders trilogy. Forged. Well, oh. I don't want to do any spoilers, but um, oh. it's not a huge part of Live Ships. But yeah. I will say the event of what happened in the town of Forge and the creation of the forged ones does impact the people like in their telling of this time, um, like when they reflect back on what happens at Buckkeep um, and when you encounter characters in the larger world, it's more impactful that way, but it's not a big plot line for live ships. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I did um I did think that there was a connection there just because like the ships and the raiders, I can't get rid of, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> just because of the ship connection and the Out Islanders, but I literally, like, I don't tend to go into high fantasy knowing the plot because it doesn't, like, it goes right over my head without any context. Um, yeah. So I did kind of make that connection in my mind, but literally just because they arrive on ships, I don't actually mm-hmm. know what the ship traders is about yet, apart from the ships are alive. I think. I find it interesting. So, like, the sentient. Sentient. Yeah. Mm. Forging almost seems a direct opposite to the skill because it's like the skill cannot mm-hmm. get anybody that's been forged. So it's almost like I wonder if someone tried making like, an attempt at making the soldiers. Or, or, yeah. Or, <laughs> I wonder if, and I don't really know why I have to back this up, but my one of my theories about the forged people, and it like it may be like way out there, but um. <laughs> Why is every what is happening? I have no idea. Rachel ruined everything with whatever she <laughs> Rachel, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, the forged people, the way that they're behaving is like almost they've lost some sort of sense of morals mm. that I, I kind of had a parallel to how people behave in modern society for some reason. And, like, I wondered if it was, like, a loss of community and, like, religious aspects, which don't seem overly present in the world, but it's kind of like, do you know how in archaic stories or fantasy stories we talk about how women should behave? It's like these people have lost the sense of how they should behave. Like they're fallen people. Yeah. Like, you know how people would say a fallen woman, like a fallen person? Yeah. Like, it's saying how they steal from people and they lie to people and they have no respect for their family members and things like that. It's kind of things that people say in religious sermons. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're like... like it seems like they've been they've kind of gone against their normal moral conditioning and it was like psychological conditioning which has undone all of the things that were pre-established by the church let's say a metaphorical church mm-hmm. because, yeah yeah i, I didn't know whether i was reaching there but that's just yeah it is a i'm reading the chat it is a a zombie-ish kind of thing like it is a it is a mystical thing that's happening to them as well. Okay. I, I see it as like a complete lack of all ability to have skill, and I know that not everybody seems to have it, but it's as though they've been drained of it in order to potentially uh, to power other people, maybe. And like if they they're not able to connect with other people, they're devoid of morals. For instance, all those are general backings of like empathy and connecting with people, which is something that you definitely need with skill. Skill is like a heightened sense mm. of humanity and human behaviour and connecting with people. And these the forged ones are completely devoid of that. And where does that power go that they have no longer got? Is just how I would see it. Mm. <laughs> That's a good question, Rachel. I agree. With you. <laughs> you know, I don't know if anyone here has read um, freaking <laughs> Truth <laughs> Witch. Yeah. Oh, right, okay. Yeah. Really. Okay. So you know how Assault has that ability over threads, yeah. kind of stuff like that. It exactly. kind of makes me feel like someone's threads have been manipulated. Yeah. And I like, feel like th- their threads have been cut. Mm-hmm. Like not even yes. manipulated. They've just been cut. Oh. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I see that as well. Like, But that's kind of what it made me think of when I was trying to envision that kind of magic. Yeah, mm. yeah I do feel Thank like they have been like, siphoned somewhere else, especially because it's literally called forging. Like, mm-hmm. There the- has to be a forge for there to be a forging, you know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, where is this going? What are you doing with it? They also don't have any foresight to their own future or care, like the girl that wouldn't bother with the second loaf of bread. Mm. <sighs> I just... I don't know. I just no. I shouldn't have done this. Like I want to read the second book now, and I can't. I need to read Mythborn this month. <laughs> I can't do it. I can't how do long it. it will take us to find out more about the forging? Because like we saw Jade do an entire experiment with a girl, and he was stumped. So I'm like, who figures it out, and why, and how? And <laughs> I'm interested to see if that's going to lead us to. Okay, I'm assuming there's a big bad, but, but I'm, I'm assuming there might be multiple big bads. But I'm assume I'm wondering if that's going to lead to the big big bad. You know what I'm saying? Mm. Mm. Cody has. <laughs> what if there is no big big bad? Like, would you would that bother you in a series if there was no big big bad? 
It depends on the next series before where there's just multiple things going on and then they all happen to get yeah. sorted. And that's the end. I'm okay with there being bad as long as something's actually still happening. <coughs> Close. But, you know, otherwise. Sorry. I don't know. It's not something I've thought of before, but it's very definitely an interesting question. I also would be surprised if we end up with a completely different royal on the throne because they're all just keep fighting about it and I'm like, none of you are getting it. <laughs> I feel like the, the royal family has been slimmed down just in the first book. Like, their advisors and powerful people have gone, like, the heir to the throne has gone. So I would, yeah, I would not be surprised at all because now we've got, like, a very small handful of people in the royal family around. Mm. It does make you curious about, like, what other... I was going to say planets. Oh my god, this is not sci-fi. Like, if like other provinces or countries kind of get involved with that power gap. Mm. Mm. I'm, I'm like back. staring at Cass right now because Cody's not really <laughs> 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 Amanda said, I like it. had a crush for a minute. I was wondering if that was bad anywhere. That was one of the really small moments that made me sad because it's like right in the middle of all these other sadness. <laughs> You went to find oh. Molly and she had someone else and I was like, that hurts. <laughs> I, I, I like talking about characters that we don't like. I don't like Molly. I didn't even care about it. I was just like, oh, that's the final like, I, name to the heart. <laughs> I feel like I didn't have much of an opinion on her. I thought I was wondering where their relationship was going to go because she was kind of more present than I would expect her to be but not very present. So I was like, mm, I wonder I wonder what the deal is with this character. But then I remember that he is quite young, so it's very possible that he's going to have multiple love interests. It could be what of one of you guys said about like a character coming back and becoming more relevant later. Mm -hmm. Then I'm not me again staring at Cody. <laughs> 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 yeah. You won't have to wait long for some of these answers. Good. Uh, yeah. That's enough of an answer to, for me. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> At least we can. But there's still time for that dude to screw, screw Molly over, which is true. What was that? There's still time for the guy that Molly's with to screw her over. True. Mm. So, um, she's I don't see my issue with, because you guys were asking for theories, I don't even think, because like, in my mind now, I feel like if I could predict anything, just anything about the next books, I haven't even looked at the synopsis, I would imagine that it doesn't take place very much in the keep. Mm. That's just the feeling that I get. So I feel like he's going to go off on an adventure to go killing people because he's an assassin. Yeah, literally the title is just called Royal Assassin. Yeah. So I'm, like, I'm assuming that's fits by now. <laughs> I'm kind of like not sure how much of this stuff that's actually been going on with the politics at the castle is actually relevant aside from being in the background because I don't think that he's going to be there a lot. But then who do we think is he going to go off assassinating? Like, what's that problem? <laughs> Who's the problem going to be? <laughs> I don't know. I find it very interesting in the end how he had to test his own loyalties mm. because I was conflicted. I was super conflicted when it was like can't. what was the scenario? Oh, he didn't think that he should kill the prince. Mm. But like the first thing that was said to him by the king was like, you do what I say. And like your loyalties are with me so I was just like because he couldn't trust the guy that was doing the spilling to the king yeah. mm. he was actually mm -hmm. I was like what does he do because like if he makes the wrong decision like if if that guy actually did skill to the king and the king told mm -hmm. him to kill him and he doesn't like oh god mm. like I feel like we should have seen that coming as well because the earlier test which causes one of the depressive days is yeah. The king telling him to steal from the king, <laughs> yeah, and even yeah. Shade sort of going along with it, being like, it throws him out and everything because he won't do it, and then it turns out that was the point, and it's like, mm -hmm. what is going on? Yeah. <laughs> gonna Everybody's to testing him from all angles all the time. Mm -hmm. Well, it's just a terrible position to put him in because, like, <laughs> be loyal to the king by stealing from the king, and it's like, well, what do you do? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> What's, yeah, no. I don't. Did he pass that test? Was the idea that he said no? Yeah. Was he supposed to say no? Yeah. And okay. then just the fuck you, I went and stole his knife. <laughs> yeah, I remember the knife and stabbed him thing, but I couldn't remember because I know the king apologized to him. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Um, I can't remember yeah, he was supposed to do, whether he was supposed to steal from the king or say no, but yeah, he was supposed to say no, which I feel like was a slight foreshadowing to the actual end mm-hmm. where he had to decide. But that was still, that was an impossible situation. Mm-hmm. What did we think about the actual assassination? Because that, that, I did not see that coming. It was good, right? It was good. It was really, really good. Mm-hmm. He, like, he walks in and he's like, oh, I'm here to kill you, but he's not actually going <laughs> to kill you. <laughs> well, um, I imagine Regal or somebody working for Regal put the poison in the actual thing, but still. Mm-hmm. I, I kept thinking of that meme, do you know, when there was the brother and sister and then Fitz all stood in the room. I just kept imagining the spider. All <laughs> right. All right. right. They were like, <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm like, no one knows what's going on. It's <laughs> a really <laughs> meme ending for a very serious kind of book. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It was amusing. It was amusing. Mm-hmm. One tiny detail that I was like, would that work? He gets pulled out of the pool by Nosy. And I'm like... It could absolutely work. Because Nosy <laughs> is a good dog. <laughs> Dogs do be kind of strong, though. If you've ever been around a horny dog, you know how strong they are. So, yeah, like... You have, like, drag him out somehow. Yeah, but he got, like, stabbed in the freaking hand, like... To get dragged out, like I'm, yeah. ima- I was imagining well, like, a proper discussion. In a very full pool to drag him out. <laughs> Dogs are incredibly strong. Um, if there's anything like earthquakes, they pretty much always survive because they can get out of anything. Mm. Very resourceful. That's how I choose to live my life, thinking <laughs> the dog's always going to survive. <laughs> I was um, a kid. I did something I shouldn't, and I told my dog to jump in a pond, and told my mum and dad that she jumped in on her own. <laughs> so, she get so I had to. She was like a, a ten stone Rottweiler, and I had to lift her. Up. <laughs> you <laughs> sowed your own seed, sis. <laughs> <laughs> the books to do things and then be like oh she just did it by herself <laughs> i just find it like the name nosy is like kind of like foreshadowing because it's like he's like she nosing around in the pool and like stabs him and you know like how the nose like, I, I don't know this is such a it's <laughs> such a stretch but like that's how i was like oh his nose is what killed him because he found him <laughs> <laughs> you keep stretching babe I'm trying so hard, yo. I can't do my Game of Thrones shit with this book, and it's so annoying. No, no. It's so annoying, isn't it? <laughs> like so having no. I, I was just being like, he had, like, his hand was bitten, and I'm like, it wouldn't have been bitten. It would have been ripped to shreds if a dog dragged him out by the hand. Shredded <laughs> Yeah. It's cool. Nosy's talented. Nosy's a good dog. That's all there is to it. Iconic, one of a ta- one of a kind, amazing, spectacular show stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Nosy is all of the above. <laughs> yeah. Okay, but Nosy's dead. How oh, dare you? Right. Wow. There you go. There you go. Wait hey, you. <laughs> anybody have any more points that they want to address? And does anybody in the chat have any more questions? Someone I... did ask what our favorite quotes were. Sorry. Oh yeah, quotes. Ooh, I didn't. I have any. I can't think of quotes, but I can think of scenes. Like, one of my favorite scenes is always going to be, like, Fitz in the courtyard and the king seeing him and analyzing him and and bringing him into the fold. That's always going to be one of my favorite mm-hmm. scenes. I have a favorite quote, and it's my fav- one of my, well, two of my favorite scenes, which is, it's too late to apologize. I've already forgiven you, which was Chivalry's <laughs> words. Yeah. Mm. And we didn't yeah. find out until the end from patience that that was chivalry saying. I love that. Yeah. Although when you just said it's too late to apologize, I did sing it in my head. It's too late. There was one thing where I was like, it's not even a big thing in the book, but I was like, oh, because well, you just kind of realize how it's one of those simple statements that makes you realize how much Fitz has been kicked down and just mm-hmm. irrelevant his entire life. Because mm-hmm. it's when, is it Fedron? He asks him to become a scribe and he's just like, somebody asked me to become a scribe. He thinks I, I can do that. And I'm like, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Mine was, um, oh, I can't remember if they're beaten, but it was along the lines of not, okay, things that are worth knowing aren't taught by fear. Shit, yeah. something like that. You know what I mean? Like something along those lines. Yeah. yeah, I remember that one. Mm-hmm. But I like that because essentially, because he's been abused. Mm. So I'm like, 
I agree with that. And I feel like anyone who's had a real, like, physically fucked up past is like, you know what? That's true. So, yeah, I like that. Mm-hmm. I like the, there's an interesting thing as well when, um, when she had asked him first to learn how to become an assassin. And he's like, mm, do I really want to be an assassin? And he says, um, learning is never wrong. Even learning how to kill isn't wrong or right. It's just a thing you learn. It's a thing I can teach. That's mm-hmm. all. And it's like, fair point. <laughs> you mentioned that actually because when they started that whole training thing, she had asked him whether he was willing to kill. Like, would he do it? Um, and if not, would he at least learn how mm-hmm. to do it and then decide later? But when it came to the point of him being told to kill somebody and him, and him being unsure about it, it was pretty much like, why are you not doing this thing that we've trained you for? Yeah. And it was like, well, you told him that you would teach him and then later he could make the choice. Mm. Where was his point where he could actually make the choice? I did expect there to be a much bigger scene about him, like his first kill. Mm. Like, that just didn't happen. <laughs> huh? When was his first kill? I, I don't think it was. <laughs> Did we see it? Somebody um asked what, what we think about the epilogue, which I've just had a look at, and it is where he's I'm putting... hella like th- that right there tells me that after the events of which what is happening. Oh my god, my English is so bad. Okay. <laughs> after the events in which the story itself is being told, there is an idea that there is an omniscient entity or person or someone who knows some shit which is going to cause further drama in his life and that's in his current life and like I kind yeah. of like that ooh I'm scared for this character now because he was baby but now he's grown mm-hmm. and in pain but like and there's even more stuff Yeah, because who is this friend? Is it actual friend? Is, is it a, a person who you think is a friend? like I was interested in that because it's kind of assumed that with the story, with the way the story is being told, that that is going to be the end. Like when we meet that point, that will be the end. But the things that actually happen in that epilogue implies that it's not the end. So there's a possibility that we are going to catch up to that timeline in the progress of the book. Mm-hmm. And then it will continue from this point, which I think is interesting because from Would the beginning it would seem like it's the end. But how old are we reading Fitz in these little snippets? Like thirty something, forty something. That's a good, you know. I, mean, I would, I would I say read him as much older, but because he seems he's like would... very weak, like he seems weak and weary. Um, yeah, and I know Cass said he's in around his thirties, forties in the middle series. Yep. So then, because um, I know, like in high fantasy, like, like, like mortality age, like age is lower. But it seems that yeah. he does still live like a pretty long life, so I would say, yeah, 60s. 50, 60, okay. I just imagine him young because I'm dumb. Read this entire mm-hmm. series as an old face telling his life. <laughs> yeah, because uh-huh. he's telling his life story, I automatically imagine him as being old, but in a fantasy world, like old is like 60. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm kind of, I'm sad actually if this is the end, like that bit that we're reading is going to be the final bit of his story arc. I kind, I want him to die tragically for the emotional impact right at the end, like after these nine books. Mm. For his death to like mean something. Mm-hmm. I just want him to freaking win know. something. <laughs> I just need this guy to have a, a, an up. <laughs> like die happy yo like yeah. i want him to die like the dog i want I, I know that sounds really vicious but i mean in the sense that i want everything to come full circle and the way how in the end of the first book it's like the dog's death and that brought him happiness like especially like the quote that Mora just put up i want it to feel like that with his ending that he made a sacrifice but he's happy with it and he's content with how he's going out yeah Mm-hmm. I feel like, not, like I want him to sacrifice himself for something, but at this point, having read one book, I have no idea what he would be sacrificing himself yeah. for. I just yeah, because I feel him. like he's sacrificed everything already. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm just, you said that you want him to have an upward point in his life, and you're in the last trilogy, so that's really concerning. <laughs> <laughs> he has good times, he has some good moments, but I need his ending to be. Moments, sis. Moments. I need his ending to be a good. He reads his life story, he has good moments. <laughs> Yeah, the epilogue is an end just because it sounds like he's gonna off himself and somewhere a friend softly say softly no is someone um, gonna kill him 
That's what I feel like. Someone's trying to kill him. I think everybody's trying to kill him. I That's thought with how weary he seems when he's writing it, I assumed to start off with that he was dying. Mm. And that's why he was writing it. Well, mm. this bit's like on about him saying fetch three leaves from mm. the herb that would kill him. And then a friend somewhere. So I imagine that's a head thing. Like it's a skill. Someone yeah. somewhere is telling him no. I just oh, came up no. with a theory, but I can't talk about it yet. She, she's gonna go dm cody <laughs> after this live show and be like this is what i thought and then we're just gonna be here like but cody's not even there yet i'm not even there yet i, I haven't, haven't read live chip yet so i'm this is the only series oh, wow. i've read oh damn yeah yeah but i feel yeah. like i've read this part this epilogue before in a different so i don't know i, I might just have like have re misremembered but i feel like i don't know you, you maybe had that me. scene before I, I don't know because <laughs> it reminds me of something that's to come, but I, I would need to confirm. <laughs> a couple of things in the chat. Um, Lucy said she wants him to be the next shade and live for a while. Joy said that she's thinking that he's old, old, and he mentions his boy, so train him the, ne the next assassin. I kind of don't want him to be the next shade because that implies to me that the monarchy is still going to be kind of as it is and all he does is stabilise in it and they carry on ruling as they are. I, I like still... to think it means the sun. Yeah. What was I going to say? <laughs> Forgot. <laughs> I also just can't. I don't know whether it's because he is so young in this and the bit we did see just didn't work, but I can't imagine any of these books having a romance. Like I just, um, I don't see it working. Mm, I can't see them having a strong, worthwhile romance. Mm. Oh, I he's just not old enough for it yet. I yeah. don't know. I feel like I could see some sort of tragic romance in there. Well, I like it's just because there is the skill and this bond, and like it could be so much stronger than just your average type of love because they have this connection and whatnot. But then I'm like, he has so much going on. <laughs> yeah. Like okay. I remember what I was gonna say. Um. We're we're like reading him as like older and weary. So this is a this is a theory I can say at this point. Like, what? As long as we're referencing to other fantasies, right? What if his connection to the skill magic or the wit magic is extending his life? Like Aragorn's life got extended through oh, his yeah. magic. So if we're reading him as like particularly yeah. wearied, what if he is? Like, what if in my brain I'm reading him as 60, but it's like a young 60, and he could mm. potentially live for longer? That, like, what's making me think, like, maybe, like, why I kind of still visualized him as young is kind of in my head that, like, um, oh my god, do not forget your point, Zaf. <laughs> oh, crap. Someone say something oh, else while I think about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll pop this up. Um, regarding the epilogue, it cannot be too far in the future, not even 30s, because I can't imagine he doesn't have some physical impediments from poisoning and then drowning. That, that's what I was going to say. Like, I feel like he's going to go through some shit that's going to physically fuck him up. So weakness doesn't necessarily align to being old, but more so like... Yeah. I feel I'm... like he didn't like get too physically impaired in this one. But I feel like in books to come, where he's going to be exploring and going out and going into really odd situations and odd places, that's where he's going to start getting physically fucked up. I think that he was injured a lot more than I expected from this book because he already has scars and stuff from what's happened to him. Um, he's been on yeah. the brink of death more than once. And this is the first book in nine books that tell his entire life story and he's only just turned 14. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's not enough, sis. Anymore. <laughs> <laughs> In terms of just general skill, anyway, with not like the skill, but like just skill in fantasy books, there tends to be a common theme where if you can do things with your mind, you're not like you're not on it physically. You yeah. either have strength or you have mm. mind, like intelligence or something like that. It's one or the other. So I, I it's don't like, think as yeah. a fighter, but he's more, he can do things with his brain. So. Like, there has to be a balance, and, like, you made a previous connection to, like, how Never Night, right? Like, how Mia has to use her mm. shadow powers, right? But she loses her eyesight. She loses her actual own ability to see, to mm. make herself unseeable. So I feel like I agree with that a lot. There has to be a cost, because I feel like every good magic system has to have a cost. Yeah, we see Verity, like, literally just sitting the entire time. Like, he's mm -hmm. doing an immense amount of magic, but he's just sat. 
<laughs> the entire yeah. time. So it doesn't matter if, like, in a later book, Fitz ends up paralysed or something. You can still do what you're doing. Mm. Mm. I think that the physical consequences of what's going on with him are going to be quite shocking to me. Because going into this, I assumed before I knew anything about it that it was going to be kind of like a warrior kind of story. Like this magical guy goes throughout his life and like he does all this cool shit and he kills all these people and he's like really badass. But it does seem to be going more towards the mental state of things. And he's already been injured. He's going to continue, I imagine, to be gravely wounded throughout this series. And somebody put in the chat, he might live longer be the next shade but be physically a mess like shade is physically a mess mm -hmm. so i do think it's going to go in a very different direction than i imagine the series to go into going into it because i still when you think of like a coming of age like there's nine books is one person's story i feel like your mind automatically goes to like this epic warrior quest mm -hmm. but that is, like even having read the first book that is automatically what my mind is going to and i don't think it's going to be like that at all like the third book is literally called Assassin's Quest, so you just <laughs> yeah. <don't> worry. <laughs> just like, I don't know why, but when I think of the Fitz and the Fool, I imagine them just like trekking like over hills. <laughs> <laughs> Geralt and Yaskia. Like, like literally yeah. that one still in the TV show adaptation where like Geralt punches Yaskia in the balls like while they're in the mountains and stuff after the whole elf escapade. That's exactly how I imagine it. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, Only this one really motherfucker hard doesn't hard. make any sense, and the this other one is just depressed. So <laughs> that's the minstrel. I've only watched the TV show. I made it I through book number one of The Witcher and didn't like it. I've only read the first book. I do mean to continue. I, I'm, I bought the rest of the series. I'm going to give it a shot, but at this point, I've only watched. Literally, me right now behind my I... head, this right here <laughs> is all of the books, and then I also bought the. Um, Fucking new edition oh. they did for Netflix. I love it that uh, much. So hearing that, I'm like, <laughs> I, I I bought them all. I'm gonna give them a shot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the last wish and I didn't get along very well. I don't like now that I've watched the, now that I've watched the series. Now I'm like, oh, this is what was going on in the last wish. So I do. Think I'm not even gonna. The first book, then you actually like the show actually makes sense on first watch. A bit, a bit more. We're not gonna talk about this because you know I'm gonna go <laughs> off on this. That's why I'm just like. <laughs> As I've far played, as um, if we bring it all back to Robin Hobb, right? If we bring yeah. it back just for a second, I don't think Fitz's story would make a good like TV show. I mm. think Live Ships would make a good TV show, but I I don't know if people would like watching Fitz on screen. I think this makes sense as a movie because of how it's written and how it's paced. Mm. I feel like it would make sense as at least an hour and a half to two hour movie. I don't see it working as any kind of TV show though. I just feel the pacing is way too off and there's too many blips for it to function properly. But you could say the same about The Witcher, but the way that they worked it out in the TV show, it actually made it a compelling storyline with more dimensions than actually just following the linear pace of the book. Yeah, agreed. Mm -hmm. Really fast. Yeah. But the, in all fact, I've read. Oh, don't get me started on Witcher. Why are you doing this to me? I'm like, oh, yeah. Dandelion. Huh? Yes, yeah, Dandelion. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. I thought he was. Everyone's referring to him as Yaskier, and I still call him Dandelion. No, yes, I'm like, Dandelion in my head. Yeah, 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 like either or works. I'm just going to really quickly say this. The only reason it works is okay. The reason it was does work as a TV show is because it like, oh my god. They're trying to basically shove two timelines together at the same time. And as you can already tell, because of the way timelines uh, de uh, de uh, revolve in the freaking story, right? The, the the TV show doesn't hold your hand, so you have to be at least yeah. have some level of intelligence. And I'm not trying to be rude when I'm saying this because some people had some issues, but that sounds like a them problem, not like a me problem. But my point is, it's like, <laughs> look here, if you just literally pay attention, if this bitch is this old, right, after all this shit has happened, if this motherfucker is literally doing all this shit and then he gets to this girl, like... <laughs> Put, literally use your two brain cells. It's not that hard. But like, <laughs> I had to watch. The it point twice. is, it's like, I'm sorry. I had to watch it twice. Well. I had to watch it twice to get it. Which is fine. Like, no, a hundred percent. I I get brilliant. that. Mm -hmm. I, I just had an issue with people having an issue with timelines because it's just like. <laughs> no, I didn't have an issue with the timelines. No, 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 no. I put the last wish into context, and so then I enjoyed the last wish more after watching the. Yeah. Because you have a better idea of what's going on, but the problem is the last one is kind of like something that rewards rereading after you actually know what the fuck is going on. Because you you just be like Yennefer, who the fuck is Yennefer? Why is he feeling bad for cheating? Yeah. So I get that. Yeah. 
I feel like the live show just descended into chaos while that's going off. And then sorry. Sorry. Oh, sure. yeah. I had to do it. We had to set her off once. Yeah. <laughs> Anything to say about Daenerys? <laughs> <laughs> I think an assassin the princess TV show would like they'd have to bulk out like the royal family side of things and like oh, yeah, and I wouldn't like that. that side of things. No, yeah. Make more stories than there are. <laughs> yeah, I think that would piss me off. Hmm. To like get those kinds of stories, I'm like, yeah, I think that would make me mad. Hmm. Just like how they did the Outlander, like they really screwed up Outlander in the later seasons. I think they would have to screw up. Assassin's Apprentice from the get-go because you're only getting fits of storyline and to make it a compelling TV show you'd have to give us more characters and I don't want them. <laughs> how, I am one <laughs> In all fairness, okay, let's look at, okay, I was going to say Shadowhunters, but like I haven't watched the show because I haven't watched the show. I've not watched the show already, but so. no, no, there's no point. <laughs> I are, what, um, I they're doing well. The rights have been bought for oh. Corona Plus to be a TV show, and I am so not happy. Wait, what's going to be a TV show? Oh, what? Throne of Glass. Oh, I've only no, read no, the book. Like, <laughs> rights all the time. Like I just think that it often never happens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like the like, rights are bought just to the right to... his book. But... Mm -hmm. The rights are often bought in to stall the market just so there isn't that competition of like yeah. another YA fantasy coming out of the time of something they're also releasing something else if that makes sense though I feel like with Sarah J Mass's level mm -hmm. it wouldn't be surprising if there was some kind of adaptation my issue with it would be that they'd make like a trashy like teenage show when the books actually have a lot more adult themes towards mm -hmm. like the end of it and it's just don't like, spoil me I haven't read any of them like I have the box that's literally right there I can, see, I can see um, Kingdom of Ash because it's like bright yellow. Yeah, I'm going to lift my camera. Gold. You can see literally yeah, yeah. all of Sarah J. Vass is like right next to each other and there's just Crescent City waiting right there. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, I don't like it when they um, adapt mm -hmm. books that are too close to me. There are some books that I've read like um, where I feel like the world would be a good place to have a story set. Mm -hmm. Like the Scythe series by Neil Shusterman, I think that would be a good mm -hmm. world to yeah. put a show in follow really follow the actual narrative of the book. I think the biggest issue when adapting things, especially on this like because it's a YA market, they don't take the character seriously enough. And that mm. always turns into the characters being turned into caricatures and it's the same simplistic narrative, the same kind of simplistic everyone's the same level of hotness kind of thing. And mm. it's like there's not actual much nuance or complexity and it takes away any kind of variety there is in it and that's what my biggest issue so if they did do that i i give kudos to them but i don't know we're gonna have to see how six of crows is adapted to like get a mm. better idea of yeah. where the industry is at mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. somebody okay. said this has made me more nervous for the next book <laughs> uh, but then I also can't even predict oh. like what do you think is going to happen in book two so I can't, I can't say besides literally just becoming the royal assassin and going off somewhere and yeah, I just yeah. think he's gonna go to people, but that's probably like, really the extent of my prediction. Really I think not. he's gonna get laid. That's my one prediction. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if I'll like Royal Assassin more upon a reread. Like I, I gave it, I liked it. I'm not gonna tell what I gave it because we'll do that in the next live show. But I it's more nice, isn't it? Then the first one, there's a lot more yeah. action in it. Yeah. 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 I didn't like it as much, but I don't want to say why. The second yeah. book, I don't want to say why. I think I'll like it more in a reread, um, but I feel like we're going to all have like the same kind of thing to say about it, at least at first, the second book. So. Do you I, think I'm on the same page as you, I think. I mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Really odd question, but like, do you think, considering The Wheel of Time is now being adapted into a TV show, do you think if that gains some kind of success, considering this series is so big in the fant like high fantasy adult community, do you think it will then like there could be any interest in this? I, I just don't know because it's not linear. Mm. Mm. Like it, it, it's linear, but the 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 breakup of the trilogies, you'd have to go fits fits, but you can't. No, mm -hmm. you can't because now that I know what happened in the other two many many years for the actors to be the right age to play the role mm -hmm. and, like, the time yeah. to be and honest with breaking dawn time, so the baby 
Maybe you're breaking down. Not having CGI babies. Yeah. They were creepy. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, who said? Oh, yeah. (laughs) Zafi, you said that the inheritance cycle, that movie. Oh, I'm so I'm still mad. I am. I have I have some tea to spill about that, but I'll tell you privately after this. Okay. I am still so mad because the inheritance cycle is such a good series. Four books. Is it Aragorn? Yeah. Yes. It's It's only four books. Dragons, talking dragons, elves, cool magic, coming in base fantasy. But the movie did it so dirty. Mm -hmm. I can't even. I have to say, actually, this actually really, really well ties into our discussion about this book simply because it's like, you know how we were talking earlier about writing, right? And how YA tends to be a bit more simplistic, action-based, da, da, da. I felt like that was the first series I read that reads like an adult, but it is for teenagers is for and like teenagers. children and stuff like that. And I feel like it's such an important entry mm-hmm. for people who want to get into high fantasy. If you want a book that literally has all the tropes and everything, go with that. And I feel like having that basis when you read something like this... And it's subverting tropes and kind of working with tropes in a more adult way is really intriguing. Mm-hmm. See, because I watched Aragorn, the movie, I didn't want to read the book series because I <sighs> thought they were going to be like children's books. It was awful. Wasn't he 12? Like, literally no, makes no. me so mad. Hmm? The movie was he awful. Was, he was 13 when he started writing them. Okay, I I yeah. know Christopher Paulini's whole story, right? Yeah. He was a kid. He was my age. He, yeah. yeah, he graduated early. Um, and he had all because he was homeschooled. He was homeschooled. Like that. Yeah, exactly. So then he made a giant whole fort thing, and then yeah. he was like, "I don't know what to do now." And then he decided to write a book when he was literally so young. And the first book was finished when he was fifteen. It was fi- he published it when he was fifteen? It was published. Yes, yeah, published. Him and his family, family like went on the tour, and like then he got picked oh, wow. up. Yeah, he got but, picked up for a bigger yeah. publisher. Yeah, yeah. Okay, do we have any part in? No, it's on a stuff of apprentice. <laughs> Back to the book. <laughs> okay, I'm done. I'm sorry to bring that up. <laughs> it's okay. Fine. No, are we all are we all done here? I can't think of anything. Okay. R.I.P. Nosy. R.I.P. Nosy. Yeah. Okay. So that is it for our first Elderling Long, which I don't think have we said Elderling Long at all while we've been Elderling here. Elderling Long. Elderling Long. I know how we can like a final thing. Fitz's father's hounds, horses, and hawks. Everyone say it. <laughs> Fitz's father's, father's, father's hounds, horses, and hawks. Fitz's what? Fitz's father's <laughs> hounds, horses, and hawks. I can't go off, Cody. <laughs> Rachel is like trying to practice. I like... can't. <laughs> no. 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 <laughs> I only, the only reason I realized that it was such a tongue like twister is because I was trying to say it in my vlog. And I stumbled over it four times, and I was like, "There's a lot of alliteration here that I did not notice before I started saying this." I'm surprised I can say it because you know what I'm like with my lisp, and I'm just like, "Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't that Okay, so the next live show is going to be on Ashley's channel. She's that way. Um, the link to everybody who has been involved in this discussion is in the description box and sometime at the beginning of June will be the live show for Royal Assassin. Feels like a long time, but it does creep up quickly. And, it's yeah. Compared. and yeah, I think it's around 700 pages. It's like, really cool. was just like you thought this was going to be a nice ride. <laughs> <laughs> I think she just wanted to get this out of the way. That's why it's only like 400 and something pages. And then she's like, all right, now for the real shit. Like. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so thank you for joining us. Thank you to my wonderful hosts for being here. And we will see you again in two months. Bye. 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 Bye.